off the year with this statement, when we truly know who we belong to, we will believe God's plans and purposes, and we will become who we were created to be. And so the first part of the year, we talked about many different aspects of what it means to belong to God, to his people, to one another, to his church. And so now we transition to this season of our year where we've been talking about belief, and we just finished a series and breaking down some things that might hinder our faith. And so we wanted to go ahead and now continue talking about this idea of believing God's plans and purposes. So let me ask you this. What does it mean to believe in God? When you think about this idea of believing in God, at least biblically in the Christian faith, there's a whole lot that is included in that statement of belief or faith. And so it's not just a simple intellectual understanding or agreement to a doctrine or to God's existence. Well, as we talk about believing in God, there is more to that. And in fact, it's somewhat of a process that God is trying to take us on from believing in him to believing him. You see, there's a difference and there's a maturation process when we talk about believing in God. Yes, we can believe that he exists, but we want to and God wants to get us to where we believe God. Do you guys get what I'm saying here? If you don't, for example, Gary and Alex Torres, some of our great awesome team leaders over here, Gary uh, is on that soccer team, and I don't know if he scored a goal or not, but he did well, I'm sure. And so Gary and Alex are married, correct? Yes. How long you guys been married now? Four years. Okay, four years. And so that's right. You guys finished our young Mary's class there. You are now experts on marriage. All right. So Gary, Gary, do you, do you uh, believe in Alex? Absolutely. But do you believe Alex? He says, I don't know. <laughs> you see, even if we were to ask you, do you believe in something, and then we ask, do you believe it, it's two different questions, isn't it? You see, of course, Gary believes in Alex. He, he believes she's married. He said, yes, I do. For the last four years, they, they've spent together. But when you ask, do you believe, Alex, that's a different question, isn't it? That's asking about trust. That's about do you trust their character? Do you trust who they are? And so God wants to take us from simple just believing in him and believing in his omnipotence, believing that he is all-knowing in all places and all-wise. He wants us to, yes, believe that, but he doesn't want it to stop there. He wants it to evolve to where we actually believe God. We believe his character. We believe his word. We believe his promises. We believe his warnings. And therefore, we actually have trust that creates action or produces action and produces a full committed relationship. And so we want to dive some more into this idea of believing God. And so the title for today is Believing God. Let's go ahead and let's pray. Father in heaven, I'm so grateful for this time to uh, get into your scriptures. I know I'm excited about what you have taught me. I'm excited about what you are, are, are going to share here today. And I pray that it is your word. Father, I pray that, that again, that you hit the right spot for every soul here. And God, that we can come away with great conviction about who you are, your plans for us, and how we are to respond. In the name of Jesus, amen. Turn over in your Bibles to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. And uh, the, the gospel, Luke, is written by a man obviously named Luke, and he's writing really a biography about Jesus. And Luke was actually a doctor, and so he decided, you know what, uh, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and do some research. I'm going to research. I'm going to go ahead and investigate more about the faith. And he's trying to uh, uh, help this. Uh, people aren't sure if it's an actual individual or, or people, but he's trying to help them understand the whole story of Jesus. And so we take it up here in Luke chapter 5, starting off in verse 1. 
It says, one day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. Let's stop right there for a quick second here. So this is very important. So these fishermen, there's this crowd that came to listen to Jesus, and they're at the shore. And then you have these fishermen, they're a little bit on the side there, and it says that they're washing their nets. And they had to wash their nets after a day of fishing because they had to clean them and prepare them for the next time that they go out to fish. And so we continue in verse 3. It reads, he got into one of the boats, this is Jesus, the one belonging to Simon. Simon, is, uh, his name's going to be changed into Peter. And he asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Let's stop right there. Again, this is important for us to understand the context here, and as you always read the Bible, you always want to insert yourself into the story. Because that's when the Bible starts to come alive. And you see what God's message for you. So you want to say, if I was Jesus, what would I do in this spot? Or if I was this person, what would I do and think? And you'll see God speak to you in phenomenal ways. But we see Simon Peter and some of his group there. They're actually not part of this crowd. You see, the crowd had come, and they're listening to Jesus speak. They had just finished fishing. They're washing their nets. They're cleaning them off. And so we see here, they either get attracted to what Jesus is saying, or they start to overhear. They're listening like, hmm, that's, that's some good stuff. Or maybe they decide, hey, you know what, Let, let's, let's clean over there. Let's put them down. But we know they weren't initially a part of this crowd to receive Jesus' message but yet they're intrigued, they're listening. And Jesus goes and he says something to them. He says, hey, you know what, go ahead and do this. Put out into the deep water and let's let down the nets for a catch. He's saying, hey, you know what, I, I finished speaking. Hey, you guys right there, you've been listening. Let's, let's do some more fishing. Now this is incredible of a scene and a request here by Jesus. These are experienced fishermen. And Jesus is going to tell them Hey, why don't you guys go ahead out into the deep water and let's catch some more fish. But they just finished fishing. And now they're getting some advice from a carpenter. And not only is this a carpenter, but this carpenter is giving them the advice to do the exact opposite of what they know would be best for fishing. Because at this time in the lake, in the Sea of Galilee, in order to catch the most fish, you would actually go at nighttime. They're in the daytime. And if you're fishing in the daytime, you would actually go to the shallow end near the shore. He says, let's go out more to catch some fish. So here you have this carpenter who is telling you to do the exact opposite of what you know to be the best way to fish. If you were the fisherman, what would you be thinking? Are you crazy? What's wrong with him? Man, get back to some carpentry work. I'm a fisherman. I mean, I don't know how many, uh, 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 um, you know, car, uh, contractors are asking their accountants for advice on how to build. And so you can see somewhat the absurdity in the eyes or potential for Peter and the guys to respond to this request. But let's continue reading. Peter says, Master, let's stop right there. That's interesting. Peter said, Master. And so th this word in the Greek means someone who has authority. And it's interesting because, remember, Peter wasn't a part of the initial crowd to hear Jesus. And so just as he either overheard or was pulled in to hearing Jesus' word, he automatically assumes or he comes to this belief, hey, you know, this guy, he, he's saying something here. There's something positive, or at least let me just show proper respect to a man who's teaching the word of God. And so he respects Jesus. And perhaps he believes maybe he is more than just a teacher. Maybe there's something like he's a, he's, he's a really good teacher. We, we're not sure yet. But let's continue reading. He says, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. So remember the scenario. 
They're fishing. They've already been done. We've already been doing it all night because, again, that's when it's best to catch. And now you want us to go in the daytime? Mm, we worked hard all day and all night and caught anything. But because you say so, I will lay down the nets. Now, that's interesting. Because you say so. Let me ask you this. Does this sound like this is some awesome, worthy of imitation faith by Simon Peter? No. Sure, there's a part of him maybe he's potentially just trying to appease Jesus. All right, man. Well, because you say so, or let me just be respectful to this, to this man of God, because you say so, or maybe there's a little more belief. Maybe he's like, hey, let's just try it out. We, we stuck it up last night, so may, let's just try. Regardless, we can all agree that this isn't this bodacious amount of great faith that's worthy of imitation, is it? Because he, he says, hey, look, we've been working all day and all night. We didn't catch anything. All right, man, but because you say so, I'm going to let down the nets. He has some because you say so faith. Let's continue reading. In verse 6, when they had done so, so he actually did lay down the nets, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. This is incredible. You know, they believed Jesus just enough to follow his directions. They said, we don't believe you just enough to go ahead and, and put down our nets into the water, and we see something incredible take place. You know, it's amazing what God can do with some because you say so faith. It's incredible what God can do with because you say so faith. You know, Simon Peter, the guys, they're fishing. They call him master, maybe out of respect, maybe out of some sort of belief. But because they trusted Jesus' word just enough to obey, they saw God's glory and power. With because you say so faith. You know, because you say so, faith really is imperfect faith. We see here, they don't have a perfect faith. It's imperfect. There's some doubt. There's maybe some hesitation. There's this idea of, you know what, I'm going to try it, but I'm actually not 100% sure this is going to work out. That's imperfect faith, and that's encouraging for you and me. Because many times we think our faith has to be 100% perfect with no flaws. Similar to what Bella was sharing, right? I have to have my faith so perfect and so on it for God now to work in my life or love me and be to have a relationship with him. And so we can think that if our faith isn't perfect, then we can't see God's glory and God's power. But we see here, God works with imperfect faith. He can work with that. You know, it reminds me of this story in Mark chapter 9 where the man uh, uh, is pleading for Jesus to, to help heal his son. And Jesus says, anything is possible for those who believe. And he responds, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. And then Jesus goes on and he heals. And, you know, that's how our faith is many times, isn't it? Isn't it? Where we believe, but there's a part of us that says, well, help me overcome the unbelief. Because I, I, I believe, and so there's this, this belief in you, but I'm not sure if I believe you. But we see Jesus working. And, you know, our faith will not always be perfect, but we need to at least have, because you say so, faith. Because you say so, faith, actually trust God. You see, to go from believing in God to believing God, believing God it, it includes trust, action, and commitment. And so this, because you say so, faith, I believe it pleases God because because you say so, faith actually obeys. And that's what we see here. Peter and the guys, they put the nets into the water. They could have just stayed. They could have said, man, I'm not going to do that. Or how about, yeah, I'll, let's do that tomorrow. They could have said, yeah, and then, you know, they, 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 they could have said, oh, we'll, we'll come back in and left Jesus there. They could have done a lot of things, but they decided, you know what, because you say so, we'll at least put our nets into the water. They believe Jesus' word just enough.
to follow. You know, belief that keeps the nets inside the boat won't see God's power and glory. When we have belief in which we keep the nets inside of our boats, we won't see God's power and glory. Because that's the only way that they saw God's power and glory is when what? Not just by saying they believe, not just by saying, yes, we would do it, but when they actually put their faith into practice and in laying down the nets into the water. I wonder how many of us right now today have our nets inside the boat. And we're wondering, why don't we see the power and glory of God? Well, perhaps maybe it's because the nets are inside the boat. And so if we have, because you say so, faith, we will lay down the nets even when there is doubt, even when there is hesitancy, even when there is a slight part of us that's like, I don't really know if this is going to work. But because you say so, faith, we'll put the nets into the water. We'll trust Jesus that he'll provide when I sacrifice. Because you say so, faith, trust Jesus, that I trust that Jesus will honor when I choose to live a sexually pure and holy lifestyle. Because you say so, faith, leads to trust that Jesus will bless when I deny myself and I actually go to meet with the rest of the church, even when I don't feel like it. It's a trust that Jesus will vindicate when that person wrongs me. You know, what can God do if we all had just a little bit of because you say so faith? What would God do in your life if you had some because you say so faith? You know, all in this room and all those of us who are online, we can have some because you say so faith today. This isn't something that's far out of reach. This is something that is right here within our grasp here today. Church, are you with me? Let's continue reading in Luke chapter 5, verse 8. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. We'll stop right there. It's interesting, Peter recognizes that something is special about Jesus. He's divine. Go away from me, Lord. He notices, wait, 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 this isn't just a regular teacher. There's something divine about this individual. And, you know, we come in contact with the divine God. When we come into contact with God, we too have these moments in which we are convicted of our doubt and our sin. And we recognize how holy God is and how, what, how much of a privilege it is to be in his presence. And so part of this reaction is totally understandable. But part of it is actually some stinking thinking. Peter has some stinking thinking. He says, go away from me. And he could have said, hey, I'm a sinful man, but go away from me. He wants to push the Lord to the side. You know, many of us can have this thinking, thinking approach to God. As was mentioned, Bella, you know, some of the, the uh, uh, talked about her view that, uh, man, I had to be perfect. And many of our kids who grow up in the church, they feel that way. Like, okay, I can't really pursue a relationship with God because I'm not there yet. I have to reach this point in which I'm spiritual enough to actually pursue a relationship with God. I have to read my Bible this many times. I have to look like so-and-so. I have to pray like this. I have to do all these things before I can actually decide, do I really want a relationship with God? And some of us, some of us in here, or maybe this was our past, some of us think, you know what? My life is so messed up, I need to get my life right before I can get right with God. Like, I just have all this sin, I have all these things going on, and I can't give God right now because I got to get myself together. Once I get myself together, then, God, I can go after you. But let's see Jesus' response. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. Did Jesus go and say, you know what, 
Simon, you're right. You're a sinful wretch. Take six months, get your life together, learn how to fish, and then come back and holler at me. Is that what he said? Did he, did he reject him? Did he push him away? He's, no. Oh, what did Jesus do? Don't be afraid. From now on, hey, here's what's going to happen. This is a radical changing moment in your life. From now on, you're going to start fishing for people. But what about all of this sinful mess? Is he still a sinful mess? Yes, but guess what Jesus is going to do? He's going to work on them. And so we can see here that Jesus rejects his theology, but he helps him overcome his fear and doubts. You know, we don't need to get our lives right before we can get right with God. We need to get right with God, then he's going to get our life right. And so some of us, we have to change it. This is, our teen camp is called metanoia. Metanoia is the Greek word for repentance. It means change of mind. We need to have a change of mind right now when it comes to God. Some of us right now, we're knee deep in sin. And so we're pushing away people. I don't think I should go to my family group. I don't know if I should take communion. I don't know if I should pray right now. I shouldn't read my Bible right now because I'm so sinful. God can't work with this. And so we think, let me get all that together, and then I'll pursue God and his people. No. God is saying, come right now, and I'm going to work on you, in you, and through you. And so we need to approach God, because why? God here reveals, I'm the person who meets you where you are, and then I'm going to take you to where I want you to go. And that's what Jesus is doing here in this scene with Peter, and he does that with each one of us. I'm going to meet you where you are, and then I'm going to take you to where we both want you to go. Let's continue reading. Church, are you still with me here? All right, verse 11. It says, uh, so they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Peter and the guys went from believing in to now believing Jesus. They had this bubbling faith. They believe, okay, you're a teacher. There, there's something that might be divine about you. Okay, there is something divine about you. To now, let's leave everything and let's follow you. They believe Jesus. They believe not only is he divine, but they believe that his word is true. His promises are trustworthy. You know, God wants to take all of us from believing in Jesus to believing Jesus. Believing Jesus means that we believe his teachings, his promises, and his warnings. Believing means trusting Jesus is the only way to heaven and not your attempts to be perfect or good enough. Believing God means you trust that in all things God will work for the good. Believing Jesus means you will be generous with your time, talents, wealth, because it is more blessed to give than to receive. Believing God means you will repent of sins because you know and believe and trust in God's mercy and his judgment. You see, true belief in God means trust, action, and commitment. And we see this process take place with Peter, and we know Peter is not perfect by any stretch of the imagination at this point. And by the time we last hear of Peter, he still isn't perfect, but he's righteous because of the blood of Jesus. Because of Jesus being his leader and the one whom he put faith in. And so here's the question for every one of us. Will you believe in God or will you believe God? Will you believe, yes, he is real, yes, he's present, Yes, he can do a lot of things, or will you believe his word, his character, his promises, his warning, and his love? And so I believe God is calling every single one of us to analyze today, do I just believe in him, or do I believe him? And so let's get real practical here for this week. Brothers and sisters, are you still with me? Let's, get, let's go ahead and have some action steps this week here. Number one, pray for because you say so faith. Go ahead and pray this week. God, help me. If you, maybe your faith is really, really tiny. Maybe it's really discouraged. Or maybe it's grand and great and that's awesome. But pray for God. Give me at least some because you say so faith. 
Now, of course, we want to get to the point where our faith is, Lord, here am I, send me. But we first have to start off and say, God, just because you say so, faith. And let's be praying for that. And then next, we have to do something. We got to go ahead and let down our nets in the waters of our life. And so you know what that area is. And the Spirit will minister or he'll reveal to you this week, what is the net that you need to let down in the water? And so this is where we take a step of faith by doing what God is calling us to do, by what we see in his word. And for some, that means pursuing God now and not waiting till you have your life together or before you become the perfect kingdom kid. Pursuing him now. That's putting your net into the water. I'm going to pursue him now, even though I'm a hot mess. For others, laying down our nets would be sharing our faith with that neighbor. For others, it would be giving faithfully, sacrificially, and consistently financially to God and to his cause. For others, it might be confessing about that sin that has you ensnared. And for others, laying down the net might be speaking to that brother and sister who you see their heart is hard. And reaching out and trying to snatch them from the fire and trap of sin so that they too can live their purpose life that God has designed them for. So as we close here, believing in God is more than intellectual belief. It's trust, it's commitment, and action. And we'll talk about some of these things over the next several weeks and months. But God can work with our imperfect faith. We don't need to be perfect or have our life in order to get right with God, but let's get right with God, and he'll get our life right. Let's close out in Luke chapter 5 and verse 4. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Brothers and sisters, I pray that we will believe God more than just believe in him. Amen.